Hi, my name is Benedict. We've got two subjects to cover in this video. Uh, rather than breaking it into two videos, one of them is relatively small. People go on and on about it, but it's pretty simple. The other one is a, a bigger, more challenging one. Maybe I'm just being sneaky and putting a small technical issue that might draw in more people to think about the larger, more emotional issue. I don't know, and nor do I necessarily care to hear people's one-eyed opinions on it. So if you just want to try and accuse me of something, don't. I'm sure not in the mood for it. After something that happened last night with um, some kind of woke hater who uh, did his level best to goose step me into some sort of Pol Pot retraining camp when he was too arrogant to realise that I was actually being a supporter. And rather than stopping to ask, hey, what is your experience in this? He cast me in an incredibly judgy role into being a hater. And if he had known the facts, he would have been incredibly embarrassed. Or maybe what's worse is I don't think he would have been embarrassed. I think he would have been just as judgy and just as hateful and just as eager to push me up against a wall and shoot me for his desire to divide rather than look for the inclusion that apparently he's looking for. Tut, tut, tut. Okay, subject one here is real world referencing. Subject two is on working with a record producer and specifically why people don't do it or don't want to do it. Subject one, real world referencing. This is the one where people worry about their mixes and how they're gonna translate in the real world and then do a whole lot of what I think are somewhat odd and obsessive things. While based upon good practice, a lot of them do become truly obsessive. I do check my mixes in the real world, but I don't check them to make sure that they sound exactly the same. Cause you know what? They never do. No experience is the same, nor should it be the same. My real world is all about going, does this story translate somewhere else? Yes, I will notice if I hear that something doesn't come out the way that I think it needs to, but it's not about saying, does my hi-hat have exactly the same frequency spectrum as it does in my studio? No. What I'm looking for is, does my story come through the same? Or perhaps even better, there are times where I've heard my work come back. I know with the Naked Head record, um, one of the songs that went on uh, radio station, I'm hearing it over the internet as they're like, Benedict, 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 we're on radio. And let me tell you, it had, it had no dynamic range, no frequency range, but boy, did it really embody the story of that song. And I was like, this is so cool. You've totally made my song sound terrible or, or my mix sound terrible, but isn't this superb because the story itself comes out great and that's the aim. So I do use real world, but not as much and definitely not obsessively. When I've got a record that's in the can, I will listen to it one of several various places. Obviously the studio I listen to it, not only when I'm working on it, but you know, when I'm killing aliens, I will probably have my current project on at various stages of the project being worked upon so that I can hear how does this feel when I'm just listening as doing something else. Yes, for the technically minded, I have a Rotel A10 amp driving some Yamo C803s, which are a nice, nice bookshelf speaker. They're, they're pretty, pretty big, pretty tubby, nice things. I've also got a set of little tiny Sony rears uh, that are sitting here really as monitor stands more than anything else. Occasionally I'll flip to them, but eh. I'm most likely to do my immediate mix checking in the lounge after having watched some television. I can't remember what that dubious thing was. I think it was uh, maybe even an advert. Uh, but you will see that there's an old Sony home theater in there. Nothing fancy. It is a heavy amplifier, that thing. I bought it for, I think I paid $50 all up for the whole thing. There are a set of towers. The rears obviously are not used. I only work in stereo. And there is a sub. Uh, this is a less than ideal system, but it does sound like the average kind of bit more fancy sound system than a Bluetooth. Uh, it pleases me. Music sounds enjoyable on it. 
And after I've been watching some television, had a palate cleanser, then I can listen to what I'm doing. And if there is something that not translating nicely, chances are I'll hear it here far more than in any other place, especially with high mids. They can disappear in, in this because it's too busy actually scooping them out to flatter us. I will also listen to things in the bedroom, but it's very rare that I will listen to a mix to actually compare it, to be like, how does this? I never do that anyway. But once a project has gone far enough that I think I, think I have an album here, then I will probably listen to it at bedtime whilst reading a book, which is actually more likely to be on my phone these days. There is actually a pair of um, speakers running at once, the Wharfdale Valdus 500 towers, which are a cheapy Wharfdale, and the old Denon SC101s that used to be my studio monitors. I think possibly an attempt to make something like an NS10 that may maybe was a little less unkind. Um, I don't love either speaker on their own, but as a pair, they actually work quite nicely. They're driven by a very old and half-broken Technics new class A amp. Look it up, whatever. They're a cheap amp. But it's all right. It drives these things just dandy. And at some stage, and I do this a lot less than I used to, at some stage I'll probably try and remember to listen to, or will get around to listening to my music in my car. That's not literally my car, but my car looks a lot like that. Uh, and I have no idea what the stereo in that thing is. It's just whatever came with the car. Everything sounds pretty okay. And whatever I put in it sounds pretty okay. Because remember, I'm never listening to say, is my 2K exactly the same as it is elsewhere? No, that's impossible. What I'm looking to hear is, does this record tell its story? If it tells its story in any or all of those locations, my job is done. But there's another thing that you can do if you don't have other locations. And one of the big ones is that people obsess increasingly over, will it sound okay on an iPhone speaker? Oh, I used to think, why would you care? But it's very, very easy to duplicate. So here's our test Equipment. We have some mixes of my own material from recent records. These first two are from the last record, and the third one is from an as yet unreleased record, which now has a name, but I'm not giving that away. The first thing I'm going to say is well, a couple of these are too loud. I know I went through and I normalized them because apparently that seemed more proper, but you know what, it's not proper. It ruins the story. That's too loud. That one's meant to be oppressively loud. Okay, so I've got my mixes and I'm going, yeah, look, I think these are good. But how do I be sure that they are going to work in the real world without having to leave my secluded box with a purple light? Well, this is surprisingly easy and you do not need, and I even argue do not want, some kind of third party built thing, especially not um, impulse responses and things that try to tell you you're in Abbey Road and all this kind of unmitigated BS. Very, very simply, what you want to do is something that works a fair bit like this. Oh look, it now sounds like a lovely phone speaker. This has converted us to stunning mono and limited our frequency range tremendously. It will take advantage of whatever properties your speakers have, but if your speakers are good enough to monitor on, any speaker is good enough to monitor or if you if you understand it and that gives us a sense of what it's going to sound like on a phone it's not about sitting here and going how perfectly does this resemble a phone because you know what every phone is going to sound different every hand that it's held in is going to make that phone sound different but it's that transition point from when you hear full range stereo to cut back to phone in mono and we can listen are the details coming through are the important details coming through now a lot of people will go oh but 
All the sub bass is mix- missing. Therefore, it sucks. Your mix is worthless. It doesn't work. Well, A, it can't work on a, an iPhone speaker or any phone speaker because there simply isn't the physics to allow us to drive low bass. The reason why most of them cut off at about 1K. But we can hear the story important parts here. We can hear the the sense that there is a a punch and the bass. It's all still there. The story is completely intact. Let's move to The melody is completely intact. You can hear that rising line. So our little, whatever it is, it's completely electronic. It's very, very clear. If we move to the ambient, this is the kind of stuff that suffers the most. But interestingly enough, it still basically works. I'm going to say this is well mixed. You can have your opinions about it, but because it works in this most brutal of situations, it works. I've also provided a couple of other options here. One is to go to what we'll loosely call a wide range speaker. Now by wide range we're lying. This still has a pretty limited range. It's going, it's starting at about 260 um, hertz and going up to, I think it's six or eight. So it's, it's still pretty narrow, but it does broaden out. Full. And it's still working. Everything's still very clear. And this is still very clear as well. I'm still running in mono. Transition works really nicely, we hear everything. But I'm deliberately running in mono here. Obviously if we put it in stereo it sounds nicer, but everything in stereo sounds nicer. That's part of the lure of it and part of the danger of it. That we make mixes that sound enormous and then they sound really flat in reality. If this works nicely in mono, it's going to work sound great in stereo, no matter what we've done. Plus, we just don't get that shock. That we do as we transition into mono. And this is all you need to do. For those that are obsessed with knowing exactly what it is and how it works, here we go. So we've got a device that does nothing but have a high and low pass filter and a monoizer. We turn it on, and in this case, it's 1K to 8K. That's our phone speaker model in the wide range. Oh, it's actually 300 to 6. That's it. It just rolls off. There's nothing else, and nor do you need anything else. I did play with putting in distortions and this, that, and the other. But you know what? They did more damage than good. This is all you need. This is good practice. Here endeth part one. Part two is about working with a record producer and specifically why so many people don't. The reasons that they give, as much as I can understand that, because I think that most people, A, don't understand the reasons that they're giving, and B, don't necessarily want to give the real reasons that they are giving. And this is not about why don't they want to work with me, it's about why don't they want to work with a record producer. So why do people not do this? The first question, of course, will be, well, why does it matter? Why would, you, why would anybody need to work with a record producer? Well, I think the simplest and fairest answer there is we get better outcomes. And I'm not going to run through what all of those could be here. No doubt some will come up. But suffice to say, if a Bowie, a Prince, a Sting... Uh, any of these people of this kind of caliber, a Van Halen, uses mix engineers, recording engineers, and record producers, 
then we have a very, very compelling reason to understand that there is good value in this. These are cats who are smart enough to do anything they really set their minds to do. Highly accomplished people who are highly intelligent and highly capable, as proven through all the things that they can do. There are some people, like Lindsay Buckingham, uh, most well known through being Fleetwood Mac, driving member, um, or driving former member, whatever whatever they're up to in their dramas this week. Uh, he is prone to producing his own records, uh, but he's also prone to, with his solo records, having records that, well, we might suggest massively underperform. I think Lindsay Buckingham has had one hit of his own in his whole career. Now, Lindsay doesn't rightly care. <laughs> Lindsay wants to make Lindsay's record and do it Lindsay's way, and he has that right because he's rich enough to do it. And he, I don't think, cares whether his records hit or not because they're still going to sell enough enough copies for him being Lindsay Buckingham. So he's the exception, not the rule. People will try to use that as being the rule why they don't need to. If you're Lindsay Buckingham, I'm happy to have a chat with you about it. Really delighted to understand your reasoning behind this because it's going to be intelligent and articulate. Um, if not, you're not Lindsay Buckingham, I think. So why it matters is about getting better outcomes. What those better outcomes are should always be just a better piece of art that performs better in its chosen things that it needs to do. The reasons given are far more of what I'm interested in here. Now, the number one reason given is money. Okay, fair enough. If I were to hop on the phone and say, hello, Mr. Alan Parsons. Yes, my name's Benedict. Have you heard of me? No. Oh, that's very disappointing. But anyway, I'd like you to produce my next record for me, please, sir. How much is that going to cost? Oh, my. Expletive deleted. That's that's really expensive. I don't have that kind of money. My last record made $15. Can you help me? Oh, okay. Well, you have a nice life then. Yeah, money's an issue. Our records don't make a lot of money these days. It is very sad. That's a whole other ball of rant. Um, if we're not supporting music, how can music support us? Um, money is an issue. But in any situation, why would Bowie put in more money? Why would he spend more money on, on, on a producer, a waste of time kind of a guy, if he didn't see it coming back? Bowie and or his record companies know it's coming back. That's why they invest it. So money is a very poor argument that no matter how much you try to justify it, it's a poor argument. Uh, an argument that I've used around this before was Celine Dion um, wanders up to a, uh, a, a successful songwriter who has hit after hit after hit, let's pick Anne Warren, um, and says, Anne, I need a new song. I'm going to make another record. It's going to be like Titanic 4. I need a new song. What have you got for me and how much is it going to cost? Now, chances are Celine's not even going to ask how much it costs because she knows it's going to be a lot. But Anne's going to go, yeah, okay, oh, I think this one's a winner for you, Celine. Presents a song, writes a number on a piece of paper, hands it to Celine's people, and guess what? It probably says a million dollars. Does Celine balk at that? Do Celine's people balk at that? They listen to it and they go, oh, sorry, Diane Warren. This is, a, this is another, my heart will go, oh, and great, we've got another hit single for Celine here. A million bucks, we're going to make three million off this, all told. Winning. Money's about investment. If you don't invest in yourself, nothing can come back. And that's a big issue. So the question then becomes, if you're using money, what are you hiding? What are you not prepared to invest? Another one that I do get... Not as often, but it's the, oh, well, the producer, or, oh, well, you, Benedict, you won't understand my music. I make this sub, 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 78 versions of sub-genre of music, and you you couldn't possibly understand it. Okay, well, if I couldn't understand it, chances are nobody could understand it. What's the point of putting out this record? Snookered. It's a pointless argument. It's an argument with no merit. Your job as an artist is to make something that people do understand. Okay, fair enough. If you're Celine, you need to make a record that 
essentially everybody's going to understand. Some people don't want to hear it, and that's okay because they want to listen to a Cannibal Corpse record. That's okay, but they understand it. Cannibal Corpse fans understand Cannibal Corpse music, but Celine fans generally don't understand Cannibal Corpse. But Cannibal Corpse songs, records, make sense to enough people, the fans of Cannibal Corpse, and in general, those who are open to it. The other 80% of the population who understand Celine songs, that's fine. But if you're making something that's so obscure that absolutely no one could understand it, then there's a fair chance that you're making something that's so obscure that even your potential fans won't understand it. Which, now when Cannibal Corpse is making their next record, as I'm sure they probably will, uh, they will be making sure does this make sense to Cannibal Corpse and potential Cannibal Corpse fans. Which is why they probably won't do, using another one of my jokes with Celine and Cannibal, call Celine in to sing her new hit in front of them because they know their fans aren't going to appreciate this. It's going to be like, that's not Cannibal Corpse, unless they find a way to make it Cannibal Corpse. Celine Corpse. <laughs> so the argument to say that, oh, you won't understand, no one can understand my music but me, saying my fans aren't going to be able to understand this music either. That's a really good sign that either you shouldn't be making this music or you should be bringing in a producer to help bridge somehow to an appropriate type of fan. Now, if you are making very obscure music, like Cannibal Corpse, say, then trying to pitch it as though it's going to appeal to Celine fans is probably dumb. So going to Celine's record producer and saying, here, can you make on the next Cannibal Corpse record may not be entirely wise. But you know what? I bet you that somebody who's of the caliber of making a Celine record at least has the understanding of what makes a Cannibal Corpse record special for Cannibal Corpse people. So therefore, they can still be a great producer. A lot of bands where they've gone to producers outside of their wheelhouse have had their biggest hits. The Ramones used Phil Spector. And while some people were a little bit like, but it opened doors for them to people hearing the Ramones as the Ramones, but in a slightly different way. He did a lot of stuff. Phil Spector did a lot of cool for the Beatles, even though they were like, we don't like it. You know what? He gave them far greater reach and hits without diminishing the Beatleness of those songs at all. A producer's about expanding your ability to A, hit the right target, as well as possibly give yourself a little bit of creep. I don't remember how many Van Halen records Ted Templeman worked on, but definitely his presence, even though apparently kind of pushed to the side, but his presence on 1984 helped propel that into being an absolute top record. So the they wouldn't understand my music is a totally spurious argument, just like the money one. Totally spurious. The other one that's starting to appear, and I don't know that the, the merit or the longevity of this, is the, oh, well, the AI tools can do it better. I can buy, you know, the, the Sprungulator 4 for less than it costs to hire you. And, and it'll de-res all, all of my sounds and, and it'll give me the perfect mix because it's AI and your mix will be human and flawed. Well, bugger me. It's BS. It's absolute BS because A, these things really don't exist properly. And B, when we listen to work that truly fires, it's often got some amazing ragged edges. Sisters of Mercy rose up to the floodland time, at least, on records that, well, sounded pretty terrible. But part of their success was in their rawness. They're like, you could feel that you were on the rusty knife edge with these records. Could they have gotten better production? I should imagine, yes, they could. But part of the whole thing was about rusty edge. By the time they got to floodland, they had enough fans to say, let's take a tilt at seeing if we can expand into a broader audience. And that record sounds great. It really does. But when the edge came off 
and we've got Vision Thing. That's a much more abrasive record because they knew that time was over and they were back to chasing a more niched audience. So AI tools don't exist and no, they cannot do it better because they can't actually understand your audience. So all of these come down to fear. People choose not to work with a recording engineer or a mix engineer, and that goes out to a record producer, somebody who's helping oversee and manage the whole project and make sure that it really does work and hit its targets, is because they're afraid to commit. They don't want to invest. A big one is that they're afraid to engage, which is all part of they're afraid to feel and the, oh, they wouldn't understand my unique music means they're afraid to change. Now, while I understand change sucks, who wants change? But a change is necessary, otherwise we're going to be right where we are right now. Without hiring Steinman, even if he only did this corrosion, this corrosion is just such a wow that people outside of the narrow goth thing were willing and able to listen to that song and go, oh my. Really? Wow, that's just, that's just amazing. So the change that happened there in Steinman doing what Steinman did best opened doors. Interestingly, going back to Celine, where Celine worked with Steinman on um, uh, It's All Coming Back to Me Now. That's the Celine that I want to own, that record. You know, if there was a whole Celine Steinman record which was like that, I would buy that, despite my general lack of interest in Celine overall. But that, that is magic work. That's a change. It's outside of. It's never going to be her biggest hit because a lot of people will be just a little afraid of that one. But that is great work. One of the great things that comes out of the production relationship, and when I higher on as a mix engineer, I tend to give a lot of production advice because largely there is no producer involved here. Some people hate that, but they're not my client. Uh, the, the, the thing is that once we really get our heads together, especially if we're in the same room, there's this magic third something that happens. Not talking means that we never find that magic third something. When you talk and you spitball and you suddenly go, what if? Or, I know, or this idea comes up. Toto's Africa, with the drum loop the whole way through, that was from the couple of guys, I think it was a drummer and bass player being in the room. Um, I, uh, I can't remember exactly the circumstances of what they were doing in the room, why they were doing it, but nonetheless, they started doing this and came up with this rhythm. That would not have happened if they had been sitting on their own at home elsewhere. Part of it may have happened, but not the amazefulness that is just that drum and bass, the percussion loop that runs through the whole song. They just recorded, you know, so many minutes of it, which is why it turns on and turns off at the end. My understanding is it's not a loop, like a sample loop that is just played the whole way through. Brilliant. Uh, those happen because you've got people together. There's a synergy that happens when you've got people together. The greatest way is when you put them in a room. And yes, they might argue, but if they're really great, they will go, what have you got? What have you got? Here, what, oh, I could be, I could do, you know, and, oh, there's this magic and you can only get that when you have got at least two people sitting there. The number of times I've had big, boring, formal business discussions with people about a project that they want to do, a website they wanted to build when I worked in websites. They'd kind of off not want to meet or they'd, they'd be wanting to leave the meeting two minutes before it even started. They'd be like, no, we need to sit down. We need to discuss what's the story you're trying to tell to your, your, your people, your consumers, the people who want to buy stuff from you or the people you want to buy stuff from you. What's the story you're trying to tell here? You know, you just being top down, we're amazeful, you need to buy from us is it's a pile of BS. No one cares. It's not going to get you anywhere. You've got to tell a story. You've got to sell a story. Speaking of McFood, they sell a story. They sell a feeling. They sell a feeling of fun and excitement in their foods. Do you get it? I don't know, but that's what they sell, and it works. Uh, so this 
only happens when you sit down and you have those discussions and, and you're sort of going, and it'll be like, the more open you are, the more that happens. And that openness can only happen when you're in discussion. It's best when you're one-on-one, -on -one, I have found. But it can still work adequately well over electronic. And I think the faster your ability to communicate, the better it works. So I think that Messenger, part of the reason that I prefer Messenger over other things, especially over email, which is so hands-off in time and everything, is that the more you chat and discuss and talk about, sometimes even digress. And, you know, I'll send people songs and they'll send me songs and I'll be like, oh, and, and, you know, it's about understanding. Then suddenly you find that extra something. So where somebody wants the most out of something. But why do they not do this? Why do people not approach me? Like most people, when they approach me, they tell me nothing about themselves, nothing about their successes, often no links to what they have done. Even if they've done nothing, chances are they've got a song they've already put, got to a demo portion or, or when they were singing on their iPhone whilst they were in the shower, chances are there's something. If they're coming to me and then looking to invest, chances are they've had a former release. Why do they not show any of this? Why do they not engage? It's because they're afraid. Now, I get that. I understand that. If I were to climb up the hillside where um, Alan Parsons has his studio, before I knock on that door, I'd be thinking, should I have brought more pairs of underpants? How's this going to go? What if he's a dick? What if nothing good comes out of this? What if I don't get my own eye in the sky? What if, what if, what if? Of course there's going to be that fear. But it's only by giving myself to that situation of going in, looking around. And let me tell you, when I looked around, why well, I'd be interested to be like, ooh, cool, toys. I would not be focusing on the toys. I'd be focusing on the man himself. How is it you came to put a saxophone solo on um, Al Stewart's Year of a Cat? Not because I care about the saxophone, but because my understanding was it was unexpected. But it's beautiful. And it helped sell that song and therefore the record. What was the mindset? That's what I'd be looking for. And I guess Alan might well say, that's enough of this. Let's go out the back, drink some sangria and get to know each other. And it's in that time that we will start to develop a connection. And this is what you're looking for or should be looking for when hiring a producer. So when you're saying, I'm not going to hire an mix engineer, I'm not going to do this because of made up reasons that ultimately just say fear, it's because I don't want to really engage. I don't want to engage with myself. I don't want to face anything. I don't want to change anything. And that's your business. But understand that as a business decision, a lack of change will get you nowhere. Um, I'm pretty sure it's Pink. When Pink first came to record label attention, she was part of a girl band. The record label looked at them and said, Pink, we like you. Band, we don't like you. And they said to her, Pink, we'll take you, but we're not taking the band. So Pink was presented with the choice of be all very noble and stay with this band who are going to go nowhere. Chances are. Chances are the record label were right. I don't think I've ever heard of whoever else was in Pink's band. I may be wrong, but I'm not sure that I have. Uh, or you can step out and do what we got to do. Now, Pink complained about being typecast as another Britney and this, that and the other. But you know what? Pink was a hard worker. Pink's always been a hard worker. Well, I'm not a big fan of her music, although her later song is interesting. It really is interesting. Um, and I think if I heard it enough, I might really actually quite like it. Um, the thing was, she was a hard worker and she did what she needed to do and she must have been open to change and adapt and adjust and become what we now see as pink. I respect that. I admire that. Uh, so this is what you got to do. This is what you got to be. She did not let her fear get in the way, much as if I were about to tap on Mr. Alan Parsons' door to start a project with him. Yes, part of me would be like, <laughs> the way. But i got to go in there and I've got to be open. And without being open, I can't get change. Change is required. Back to the pink example. If pink had pushed through with the band that was whatever the band was, there would have been no outcome or no useful outcome. She would be a waitress or whatever. I don't know what she's capable of doing outside of music, but let's assume she would be a waitress. Still, 
that's not a win for Pink. It's not really a win for anybody. It's definitely not a win for all the fans of Pink's music. Um, or even for me, for being able to know that there was somebody who had courage to go out and do her thing. Because Pink does her thing. And I admire that. Uh, if you don't make these changes, you're going to stay right where you are. So working with a producer is about change. It's up to you what you do, but change can be a good thing. And if it goes wrong, you've still learned something if you are remotely smart and have engaged in that process. You may have learned, hey, I learned that I don't want to go down that path. So why people don't choose to work with a record producer, most of the reasons given I call BS on. Money, yeah, okay, there's very little money in making a record, but really it's not about money, it's about self-investment. If you won't invest in yourself, how are you going to get a return? Celine, as I said, she'll spend a million dollars on a Diane Warren song without batting an eyelash because she knows there's going to be three million in return. That's two million spare dollars, thank you very much. The numbers are big because the numbers are big because she's Celine. Producing a record, you can't guarantee you're going to make any more than the regular $15, but you know you did good work. And if the work is good, chances are, even if it doesn't come this time, you're a step closer to making your Dancing Queen or My Heart Will Go on in whatever form it is that you are chasing it's all about those better outcomes. They wouldn't understand my music. It probably always says to me, I don't understand my music. I don't understand my fan base. I'm living in hope, but I'm afraid to actually commit to something, anything. The Ramones were very committed. The Ramones were always nothing but the Ramones. Even when they did the the, uh, the goopy, I think, Ronette's love song, which is hilarious. It's very Ramones. So they wouldn't understand my music. You don't understand your own music. And AI tools can do it better. I'm just like, really? Really? you got to come up with something better than that. Realise what your own fear is. Commit to what matters. If making a record that you can be proud of having made matters, then this is what you've got to do. And working with someone else will help you tell a stronger story. If you don't feel this person is going to help you tell your story, not by going, they don't understand me, but after some serious conversations, by all means, walk away. But you shouldn't be going to somebody who's clearly at a mismatch in the first place. And when you got there, you've got to engage and have the courage to actually feel and change. Like when Bob Ezrin said to Kiss, lads, we're not going to have any hits here and you're going to fade as a band if we can't have a real hit with girls. Do, 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 Beth. Well, the video is hilarious. It was their first number one hit and they were bulky about it, very bulky and quite childish apparently, which they acknowledge themselves now. But they grew from that experience, not only in their bank accounts, but as musicians, which meant later that Paul Stanley was smart enough to go, hmm, I was made for loving you with a disco beat. And Shandy, even though Shandy isn't a favourite song from a lot of people, it's my favourite. And I know there are quite a few other people who love that song. It's not classic cliche Kiss. And that did do well on the charts. It made them another pile of money and kept the Kiss ball rolling. If you have any questions about this material, or more importantly, actually would like to hire me or consider hiring me, then let's get into conversation. You can start below, you can go to my website, there's a massive form, I will ask you to fill that in as well as possible. Because remember, the less you tell me, the less I can help you. Even if that is to go, look, ultimately I'm looking at everything here and I'm not feeling that we, that we are a good fit for each other. If you send me nothing and we could have been a good fit, I'll probably say we aren't a good fit because I got nothing to hang on to. Have a great day.